Then the credible nerds present the fourth Taviran, a Wheel of Time podcast. The Wheel of Time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. Welcome to the 4th Taviran, a Wheel of Time podcast from the Credible Nerds. This is episode 5, I'm covering chapters 21 to 26 from the Eye of the World, which is book 1 in the Wheel of Time epic fantasy series, written by Robert Jordan. My name is Justin, and as always I have my co-host with me, Mark. Hey guys, how's it going? So first up, chapter 21, it's called Listen to the Wind, and this chapter icon is a staff with Nynaeve's point of view, uh, along the river Ar- Aranel is kind of where we're setting the, the setting for this, this chapter. And the characters involved in this chapter are Moraine, Lan, and Nynaeve. And if you remember the last few chapters that we talked about in the last episode, um, the group fled Shadar Logoth, being chased by Trollocs and Mashadar, and the group got split up. And we read about Matt and Rand and Tom, how they jumped on that boat, uh, the spray with Bell Doman, and then Perrin and Egwene swam across the Aranel and are kind of out there just hiding out. So, this is the rest of the group Maureen, Lan, and Nynaeve. So we got some interesting conversations between this group. So, Nynaeve wakes up, she's trying, she's by herself by the river. She's looking out for Trollocs and she's trying to find the rest of the group. But she ends up running into Moraine and Lan. She kind of sneaks up on them. But well, she sneaks up on them is kind of stalking them a little bit, kind of see what they're talking about. But Moraine senses her and tells her to come out. And Lan is surprised that she's there. So Lanny is kind of like, ah, I snuck up on a warder. That's cool. So she's a little proud of herself. So they're talking about kind of what. Moraine's plan is what did she get them into and they start talking and Moraine tells Nynaeve that she can wield the one power as well she has access she can touch the the source for the one power um so what do you think about that Mark is, is it a little too convenient or I don't know I didn't think it was I thought it was different like oh another person can touch the one power but mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it was it worked out. But did you do you remember your initial thoughts on that? Uh, I thought it was cool how they explained it, right? Um, that you know some people are born with it in them, and some people can learn it. And I like that idea because uh, you know it's always the idea that it's like, oh, uh, I'm special because I was born with this, so somehow I'm just a better person, you know. But I like it how it's kind of been like, yeah, people are born with it, but these people can learn it. And then, you know, uh, if you're not, you know, guided and taught certain things, then you have a chance that it can kill you, right? You know, they talked to Nynaeve about that and how she probably went through some tragic uh, or or event uh, that she survived. And, you know, basically her body adapted to this power uh, to accept it as opposed to fighting it and destroying her, right? I thought it was really neat about how they brought it all, especially because Nynaeve was so against the Aes Sedai, right? Wanted nothing to do with them. They're horrible. I hate Moraine. I hate, you know, uh, everything that you're doing to these kids. It, you know, it's your fault. And then here it comes that she is basically one of them that's learned to do it by herself. And now she's really like, it's an eye opener to her. And and I thought it was a, a cool dynamic how she was so sure of herself and all, all of a sudden now she's not sure. So she becomes more stubborn. Right. And yeah. that's exactly what she ends up fighting, you know, for like the next five books <laughs> yeah. is the stubbornness that like, she just can't accept it. That like, man, this whole time I was this big jerk and here I am one of them. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, she, accuses Moraine of 
manipulating them and promising them things that's not going to happen. But yet, Nynaeve is the biggest bully of them all. I think Nynaeve is somewhat jealous that Moraine's able to do that just as well as she is. Uh, so I think, because there's a lot of conflict between Nynaeve and Moraine throughout the rest of the story. Because they're both stubborn, they're, well, they're both headstrong and they both have their agendas that they want to be fulfilled. But their agendas are different from each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting to see how both their stories kind of develop after this. But um, I, I, for me, it kind of brought uh, Nynaeve alive, right? Because before it always seemed like she was really one-dimensional. Yeah. Uh, you know, my way or the highway. And then this kind of opened up a new uh, dynamic to her and allowed her story to expand in in new ways, as opposed to just being this headstrong wisdom who's coming to get the kids back. I don't care about some stupid Trollocs that almost killed us all. I don't care about no Mashadar. I don't care about this. These kids are coming home. And, you know, it was just almost like so linear. It was annoying. And then now it's like, oh, wow, her story can go places. And, and it did, right? And I ended up becoming one of my favorite characters, like from one of my most hated characters to one of my more favorite characters. So yeah. I, I think that it, it did a good thing. And, and we kind of talked about it, right? That, that Nine and Eve, probably the replacement for Daniel. Yeah. And I think it was a good replacement because it brought a lot, a lot to the story. Yep. And in this conversation that they have, Moraine tells Nine Eve that she – with training, she could be the most powerful Aes Sedai ever, or at least in hundreds of years. So that kind of rocks her world. Because <laughs> oh, so much yeah. that she, she tells yeah. Maureen, you know, don't tell anybody about this. Because mm, she says like, oh yeah, like I was the most powerful one and Egwene's going to outstrip me and you will outstrip her by as much as she outstrips me. So now it's kind of a, eye opener to like, oh crap, she's got something special, right? Yeah. Like she is special. She's not just like a wisdom. Yep. Yep. She's more than more than that. So that's a good conversation. It's pretty close to how Moraine and Egwin had, had talked earlier a couple of chapters ago about her being able to use the power. So it was good. I liked it. They, she gets called a wilder. I don't know. Did we talk about that at all? No, so we didn't. So she gets called a wilder. Um, Moraine tells her that she's a, a wilder. And what a wilder is, is basically kind of what we said is, is a person that has learned to challenge, to channel themselves without the proper training. And they, they talk more about this, I guess, in book two, right? When they get to the White Tower. And so we can talk more about it later, but it's basically frowned upon. Not a lot of sisters... Uh, in the White Tower, except Wilders, uh, because they have this, they're so stuck in traditions, they just believe that you should be trained as opposed to learn yourself. So she'll deal with that later, and, and you'll see how that works. But, you know, th that's what a Wilder means, is, is just somebody that's learned to channel themselves, and it's used as a derogatory statement. Yeah. So then they kind of, well, they decide that they need to move on and go track the boys. Because the Dark One wants them and they need to, to help them. So it's revealed that she, Moraine, gave the boys a token, which was those coins, that she's able to track them. But two of them have lost their coins. So they should go find those two first. And Moraine knows that there's one of the other boys is across the river and she'll be able to track him later if it comes to it. But for now, they're going to go after the, the two boys on, that are heading south on the river. So they take off to go track them. And that's, we know that's Matt and Rand. Rand. So that's how that wraps up. We learned that Nynaeve can channel too, and she's going to be powerful. So pretty important stuff is revealed in this chapter. Chapter 22, called A Path Chosen. And the chapter icon is a tree, and the point of view is Perrin. And like I said earlier, Perrin and Egwin are across the other on the other side of the river Arenel than uh, Lan and Moraine and, and Nynaeve were. And in this uh, chapter, we got Perrin and Egwin spending time. And this chapter is kind of 
I don't know, not much happens. It's basically Perrin and Eggwing meet up and they decide they're going to go um, towards Whitebridge in Camelin and meet up with the rest of the group. Bella's alive. Eggwing is riding Bella. I think Perrin's horse didn't make it, right? It's just, they just have Bella. Yeah, they just had Bella. I don't remember. He got thrown from his horse, right? He was riding towards it and the horse stopped and kind of just dumped him in. Yeah, I think that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So he's gone. Bella. Bella survives, obviously. Um, <laughs> Super horse. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, Bella is the only being in the entire world that could survive um, Bellfire. But uh, <laughs> uh, she. So she makes it. I mean, makes it across the biggest river in the world, raging down the you know rapids, and no problem. Well, Bella is one of the Forsaken, right? It's got to be. It's got to <laughs> be. The fourteenth one. 14th Forsaken, I don't know, maybe a hero of the horn. Uh, who knows? Yeah. So anyway, um, this chapter for me just kind of illustrates that Perrin and Egwin are good friends. There's no romantic interest there. Um, they're just friends. And this chapter reveals that, that they're, they have a fun time, even though there's this big crazy sequence or about you know, the day before. They're still able to relax and enjoy each other's company as they travel to meet up with the rest of the group. The, the gist of that chapter, pretty simple. Yeah, pretty simple chapter. I'm not going to lie, it's a little boring, but uh, just, you know, it's kind of setting up uh, some story for later. Yeah. Chapter 23, Wolf, wolf Brother. Sorry, Wolf Brother. <laughs> um, chapter Icon as a Wolf, which ends up being a huge deal throughout the rest of this story. Point of view is Perrin. And again, they're in the wilderness traveling. Perrin and Egwene are. And we're introduced to a new character called, I call him Elias. Is that? Yep, sound? Elias. Yeah, that's what I say. Yeah. So Elias, they come upon him. I think it's getting dark and they smell fire. And they see this guy around a fire and he's cooking rabbits. So they go over there. And it's Elias sitting there. He wears clothes, clothing made of furs. And we see that this guy, Elias Machera, has yellow eyes. They look like polished gold, golden eyes. So Perrin and Egwin show up to the fire. They ask if they can have some. Elias gives, shares his food with his cooked rabbits with them. And they talk about where, why they're there, where they're going, that sort of thing. And as they're doing that, these wolves show up by the fire. And Perrin notices that. We learn that these wolves have names. Dapple, Hopper, Burn, and Wind. And we learn that Elias can talk to them. So we get our first introduction to a character who can talk to wolves. And I believe they're all called Wolf Brother, right? Yeah. Yep. It, it, they're known as Wolf Brothers. I think Elias talks a little bit about this, you know, with with Perrin kind of, you know, because he senses uh, what Perrin can do and just tells him like, hey, look, you, you can talk to wolves too. And Perrin is just in unbelief, like no way, you know, you, you're talking crazy old man, you know, like what's wrong with you? And, you know, basically tells him like, look, talking to wolves is is something like older than that, the I said I, right? Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, it's existed since before the eyesight eye existed. It'll continue to exist, it sounds like, for forever. So, uh, you know, it kind of goes in the history of that. And it's kind of cool, too, like, as you, you know, kind of run the story, like, that these names, Dapple, Hopper, Burn, and Wind, they're not as simple as just that, right? Right. Uh, like, they're like, uh, I, I don't even remember how he explains it, but it's like, it's more than just wind. It's like the wind on a, a cold morning that's blowing through the blah, 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 blah. And it's pretty neat, you know, how it all works out. And uh, and it talks more about it, but really for Perrin, that this is kind of his paradigm shift, right? We saw that happen to Nynaeve, Nynaeve, and now we're seeing it happen to Perrin. Like this moment defines his future. And I've always wondered, like, if this moment didn't happen, would Perrin still become the Perrin we know? Like, it was almost like it was waiting for this moment to happen. Yeah. To kind of jumpstart things. Because yeah. uh, he kind of senses, like, he notices the wolves come. He senses it, even though he doesn't realize what he's sensing. He senses it, right? 
Yeah. And uh, I, so that's like the kind of the first thing. So it was always interesting to me because, you know, after this, he goes through some big changes and, and we'll talk about those as they come because it happens gradually probably over the next oh three or four books. And then all of a sudden it just jumps right in. So and we'll talk about this as it goes, but it, it, it's really neat for Perrin. Uh, he is a really one dimensional character for like so long, but uh, uh, once, once he opens up, once, you know, he goes through the shift, it's really great. Yeah. And I, I was always intrigued by how this power, this gift was older than anything. And they didn't, they don't, because it's so old, I wanted to know more about it, but they never really explain it. And I don't know if, the the knowledge has been lost or they just don't, there's only a couple of people that are able to do this. So they just don't know, but I always thought it was intriguing. I mean, I wanted, you assume that it's, it's an ability from the first stage, right? Yeah. Because if it predates Aes Sedai, then you know, the first age was obviously, you know, whenever the wheel started, obviously there's no beginnings, no endings. But, I mean, there's a beginning, you know, at some point. And at that moment, obviously Aes Sedai, maybe people didn't know they had the power, but this power existed. So I, I would assume, I've always assumed that it started in the first stage. Yeah, that's a safe assumption, I think. And I always, I always wondered, I, when I reread it, we don't, Perrin doesn't have this ability till now right like there's yeah. no hint of it beforehand is there no like you know there's never been anything he never says or mentions anything like oh he sent something or he saw something a little bit better or, you know any of that and all that will make sense later but <laughs> you know yeah that, that's why i've said like did this moment have to happen to jump start his you know what he becomes yeah so do you think aaron and elias coming in contact with each other or them, him coming in contact with the wolves that that like awaken it in, in him or. or we yeah, know. I would think, I think that's what it is. Cause Perrin lived in two rivers. Now I'll be, it's, it wasn't huge, but it was big enough that I'm sure it warded off wolves, right? Like they weren't getting super close and coming in real close. And so I think this is probably one of his first times where he really was close to a wolf and then the connection happens and there you go. You know, it, it kind of gets it going. And so that's, I mean, but I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe it would, have, it would have happened anyways, but I think that this is one of those things where the the creator to some degree had a hand in it. Yeah. You know, like here's a Taveran, right? It's kind of like the whole Taveran thing, like where, you know, they can kind of shape things to, to their world, but in the end, the Taveran are spun out to correct things. And in order to correct things, their lives are pretty, you know, tightly controlled, like these things will happen to receive this ending, right? And, you know, it's kind of like, well, you haven't had wolves in your life until now, so boom, here you go. Here's some wolves. Yeah, and we know the dangers of this in future books. There's explanations as to what happens if he can't control it. So so this chapter is a pretty big deal with Perrin. Um, He basically learns his destiny, part of his destiny. And it changes everything for him. Connection with the wolves that he, he's starting to learn how to, how to use. And I think it's kind of interesting to note that uh, Perrin kind of goes through the same struggle as Nina Eve, right? Like as the book goes on, like they're, they're for sure two river folk, right? You know, yeah. you know how stubborn they are and they don't want to change. And these two go through books. And I, I mean books, <laughs> like it's not going to be something that's going to be next chapter. You'll be like, oh, now I get it books will go by and they continue to fight against like their destiny. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, fine, I'll do it. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and so it, it is pretty interesting, like to watch the two rivers folks go through their life altering changes to what they become because it's all the same story, right? They're so stubborn against it. And it's, uh, you know, they always talk about how stubborn two rivers people are. So it's, it's kind of fun that way, but Sometimes it gets annoying, like the Kaladin syndrome. You don't know what yeah. that is, but I know what it is. Yeah, I agree. All right, chapter 24, Flight Down the RNL. Chapter icon is a harp. Point of view is Rand. And we're aboard the boat, the Spray, which is Bell Doman's boat. 
characters are Rand, Matt, Tom, Beldoman, and Bilesamon makes another appearance. We're back on the spray with Rand, Matt, and Tom. Uh, this chapter starts off with Rand's dreaming of Balsamon again. I don't know. I'm, at this point, I was kind of getting tired of that. The whole, because he kind of, he said the same things over and over again. The eye of the world won't serve you. Serve, join me and serve the dark one. You know, it's just starting to get old. Mm-hmm. Then he wakes up. He's He's back on the boat. I guess in the, in the dream that he was having, he pricked his fingers on some thorns. He wakes up, his fingers are bleeding. He kind of got that going on. Same thing happened with the rats back in the last dream uh, where they were actually killed. Well, it's interesting that, the, that those dreams are never fully explained, <laughs> like how it happened and how Balsamon knew it's probably one of these three boys and here's these dreams and why they're all the same. And, where do the dreams occur? Do they occur in a tell tel- and Raya? Do they occur in a dream shard? You don't know what that is, but you will. Um, you know what I mean? Does it uh, occur in certain things? And, and it's never explained, right? Rand asks him in the very last book, like, I, I never understood how you did that. And Balsamon just smiles it off. Yeah. Right? And so you never know quite how it is. But yeah, I mean, it gets repetitive. You're like, okay, we get it. You're trying to kill, you're trying to hunt them down and they can't serve the other world, blah, blah, blah. And uh but I always found it cool that like, you know, kind of our first glimpse at Tel Aaron Riyad where, you know, dreams can have lasting consequences. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good and point. So it's kind of something like, like this is like a foreshadow. You don't realize it is. And I don't think you realize it for another book or two, but you know, it's kind of a foreshadow to like the dangers of dreaming and that, uh, you know, things can get real and, and so watch your dreams. No, I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Kind of interesting. Yeah. So Rand and Matt learn from Tom. Takes them on as his apprentices to juggle and tumble and sing and play the harp and all that stuff. So he starts teaching them, which ends up helping them out later on throughout the story. As they're going by the sh- on the river, looking at the shore, it's kind of boring. Uh, Rand notices uh, this big tower of polished metal. It's like 200 feet high and there's no marks on it or there's no doors. You know, there's no way to get inside. And Matt says, oh, I bet there's treasure inside. So, uh, which is significant. We mentioned this because there's a whole book named after this tower. (laughs) Book 12, I believe. And it's the Tower of Genji. And we don't really get back to this for quite some time but it's it's interesting that even in book one the beginning chapters of book one robert jordan knew he was going to use this tower he put it in the story yeah on purpose and you actually talk about it a lot you just don't realize you're talking about it yeah until like book 12 and then all of a sudden you're like oh holy crap right like uh it all makes sense so um it's pretty interesting we're not going to give that up because you're going to read the whole book and you're going to wonder, oh, is this it? Is this it? When it happens, it'll be awesome. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's book 13, actually, just to be credible. Yeah. Yeah. It that is book 13. That it was my mistake. Book. So, um, yeah, important book. It just mentions it now. There'd be no consequences or anything for plenty of books, but um, keep, you know, don't forget about it. So, they're on the boat for a couple more days. This part was weird, but whatever. Rand climbs on the mast of the, the ship. He's way up high, and he's just kind of up there watching the shore go by again. He about falls off, and he just laughs about it and swings down and jumps down off it and lands, and he's having a good old time. <laughs> it, was just, it was just like he was high or something. But he notices that Matt has a dagger, a curved dagger, the curved dagger with, you know, the ruby hilt. So this is when we realize that Matt took something that he shouldn't have that came from Shadar Logoth. And that Matt tells him, hey, you can't tell anybody anybody about this. This is our secret. And of course, right? Like, oh, you told his uh, knife that uh, at this place, it's obviously certain certain evil that killed all these people and Moraine told us not to and you don't want me to tell anybody? Yeah, don't tell anybody. Gotcha. 
Okay. We'll keep it a secret. I'm your best friend. I yeah. will keep that secret. Yeah. But then we learn. That, that's a good friend. That's, those are friendship goals, people. If your yeah. friend does something that might kill him, you keep it secret. Yeah. So. We learn later on the reason why Rand is acting so strange is because it's a side effect of him channeling the one power. He's just doing a little bit here and there, but it still has this weird effect on him. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note too that they talk about what Nynaeve went through. Nynaeve, how do you say it? Uh, I think it's pretty interesting to note that uh, the things that, you know, uh, Moiraine talked about Nynaeve went through, you start to see the parallels what Rand is going through. Right. Right, how it starts, you know, affecting him in different ways and things. So it was kind of like a good, good that we got that to foreshadowing because when i remember my first time reading it as i was reading it i kept thinking like oh this is the same thing she went through and uh, so it kind of helped me understand why he was going through those things yeah and i didn't pick up on it in the first read i just thought it was weird they also bring up the sea folk searching for their coromore which we'll learn about later on there was mention of heartstone i believe and something about a hollowed out mountain with a spire a hundred spans high that kills anyone who goes within a mile. I don't think we ever visit that again, do we? Yeah, isn't that Shea Ghoul? It could be. Huh, I wonder. That's a good question. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. I mean, when you said that, that's what I thought of, but I don't think when I was reading, I really picked up on that. Yeah, I didn't either until rereads. Because I don't think we ever hear from it, hear about it. But it could be Shea Ghoul. All right, so chapter 25, The Traveling People, which as, I, as we do this review, this reread, it's amazing how much stuff has introduced in these first, up till now, 25 chapters. Traveling people play a major role throughout the rest of this book or the rest of this series, uh, directly and indirectly. So pay attention to these guys. Chapter icon is three leaves on a branch. Point of view is Perrin. And we are introduced to some new characters, but we got Perrin, Egwene, Elias again. Uh, and then some some of the traveling people, Rain, Ela, and Aram. And again, Perrin and Egwene are now with Elias, and they're out in the wilderness just traveling, trying to find their way back to Whitebridge with the rest, to find the rest of their group. And the traveling people are also called Tuathan. And what they are is they follow this thing called the way of the leaf where there's no weapons, no violence or fighting. They got these brightly colored wagons that they travel around in and they sing and they dance. They're kind of like the, what do they remind me of the Russians? The Like the gypsies. Yeah. The gypsies. And I have no idea if that term is like offensive or not. Cause I've heard. <laughs> yeah. So if it is, we apologize. That's just what it makes me think of, right? Is like a gypsy, like the ultimate pacifist gypsy group. Yeah. Right. And and I only say that just because of like they're you know if you read the book and you under kind of understand them like they're just the way of life kind of seems like that. You know what I mean? And not that I know any gypsies, not that I've actually seen how they live, but my general idea and thoughts from what they are because of movies and books and stuff. That's what it matches. Yeah. So they meet up with these Tuathan and they start talking. They know Elias. They've met him before and they know his story. So they introduce Egwene and Perrin to them and invite them to stay the night to eat some food and relax. And Perrin and Egwene learn about the way of the leaf and what their, what their deal is. Up until now, the Tuathan are also nicknamed the Tinkers. And their, their thing is that they will steal stuff. So you don't want to hang out with the tinkers or invite them over near your town because they'll steal the pots and make off with, I think it's children and all that stuff. Children. So kind of these weird stereotypes they have about them. So Egwin and Perrin are, are nervous about spending time with them. But as they spend time with them, they, they learn that they're nice people. They just want to have fun, relax. They don't want to hurt anybody. And they spend time talking about this way of the leaf and how the philosophical arguments, they're not hurting other people, not fighting other people. And they're like, well, what do you do if people attack? And they're like, well, we just, we don't fight back. They're a little put off by that. 
one of the things they do talk about that I think is important that the leader rain is that how you say rain rain yeah I, I say rain like you know yeah. it's raining and stuff yeah rain tells them a story about a band of tinkers who are crossing the wastes uh, which is we'll learn about more later but it's just like this desert they're crossing the waste two years ago and they encountered a group of maidens of the spear who are Aiel, a uh, group of people called that Aiel. And they encountered these maidens of the spear who had gone into the blight, which is a different area we'll learn more about. It's the bad guys area, I guess you could say. And they came back and they were attacked by some Trollocs. And all the maidens, all this, these maidens were killed except for one who crawled to a tinker's wagon, gave them a message. The message was, Leaf Blighter means to blind the eye of the world. He means to slay the great serpent. Warn the people, Sightburner comes. Tell them to stand ready for he who comes with the dawn. And then she died. So we got this apocalyptic message from this group who tells the tinkers and the tinkers spread it through there their group of people and this was two years ago and then they tell Egwene and Perrin about this and they're like what (laughs) what does that mean and I think us as readers the first time we're like okay what does that mean (laughs) yeah like whoopity do yeah some crazy ladies given you know talking about hogwash you know yeah so but it it, uh, definitely comes to fruition later on in the story It's important to remember, I think they bring it up a couple more times later on, but it's a good introduction to to this topic. Then they start dancing and singing. Egwene dances with Aram, who's this, you know, the the cute guy of the group. Perrin's a little jealous. He thinks Aram looks like Will Alcine from the Two Rivers. And then we get, I think this is the first time we get this reference, but Perrin thinks that Rand would know it to about what happened between him and Egwene. Because I guess Egwene gave him a hug or something and said, oh, you're a nice boy. So parents like, oh, Rand would know what to do. <laughs> these, these three idiots are like the guys that get the most chicks and then the most idiotic guys when it comes to chicks, right? Yeah. Like, it's so funny. Like, they're just like nonstop. Oh, yeah, they would know what to do. And it's apparent that none of them have any clue. <laughs> None of them know what to do. (laughs) Yeah, like at all, right? I think they're just, you know, small village style where everyone's kind of like, oh, Rand will marry Egwene and Matt will marry whoever. And you know what I mean? Like it ends up being almost planned out for them, you know? So they don't actually have to put in any effort. And now they're in the real world and they're like, oh, effort? I I don't know what to do. Did (laughs) did she smile at me? Did that mean something? Yeah. When we made out, was that important? You know what I mean? Like, you're just like, come on, guys. Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of funny. Yeah. I think Matt picks up on it quick, the quickest as we go yeah. through the story. Yep, that's true. All right. So we're introduced to the Tuathan, the Tinkers. And we hear about the way of the leaf. The, uh, another big topic of discussion is that the Tuathan are searching for the song but they don't know what the song is about or really anything about it other than they need to find the song. Mm-hmm. That'll be revealed later on what that is, what that means anyway. Yeah. In about 13 books. <laughs> so, and they'll, they'll talk about that later on too. So you'll remember chapter 26, white bridge. So they finally make it to white bridge. Chapter icon is a harp, which usually stands for Tom and what you know, is going on with him. Point of view is Rand. We're on the sp- back on the spray with Bell Doman, Rand, Matt, Tom, and Florin Gelb, who is the the watchman on the boat who wasn't watching, was sleeping when the Trollocs attacked. So he's no one really likes him. So they they come into White Bridge on the river. They make it there. They see the the White Bridge, and it's this. I always pictured it as kind of like that arch in St. Louis, where it's this huge structure, like this arc, more like it's more of a bridge, but pretty similar to that that arch in St. Louis, and it's white. So they're they're marveling at that. It's a structure from the Age of Legends. They 
get off the boat, they go to a tavern called the Wayfarer's Rest. And the innkeeper there knows Tom, so he's kind of telling him the latest news. You hear about Loghain, the false dragon who can channel again, but he's been captured by the Aes Sedai. Uh, the hunt for the horn has been called, and all the hunters are meeting in Ilion. And Tom's thinking he wants to go to Ilion to be a part of that, uh, to be a, a gleam in there for that whole experience. But then the innkeeper recognizes that um, there's two boys, and he remembers that Pat and Fane had been there in a murdraw. They've been asking about these two boys. So he recognizes them. He kind of gets a little cold and distant, say, hey, I got to go. You guys need to leave. So the Rand and Matt and Tom, they come up with a plan to sneak out and head to Camelin. And R- Tom tells them, okay, we're going to go to Camelin. We're going to meet up in an inn called the Queen's Blessing. And then he tells them the story about his nephew, Owen. And that's why he's helping them. I don't think we get much detail. Just that Rand reminds him of his nephew, Owen, right? Mm-hmm. So they're trying to sneak out and they're almost out. And a murder all comes up on him and attacks him. Tom tells the boys to run. and He stays behind to fight the murder all. And they just take off running. He gives them, Tom gives them his coat and his harp and his gear. And they take off running. They hear screams of pain, they hear flashes of light, or they see flashes of light, and then they think that Tom was dead, was killed, or at least Matt does, Rand isn't sure. And that's the end of the chapter. Yeah, yeah, intense chapter, right? Yeah. Especially right there at the end, it kind of drew me in, and I was always so bummed, right? Because here's Tom, I like this character, they're building him up, and then he martyrs himself, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh, you guys run, I got this. And, you know, everything we know about Midroll is they're just crazy, scary. They're tough. You can't beat them. You just run, right? And, uh, I mean, you talk, I mean, we heard about him a little bit before. And even Lan was chasing one of the Midroll around and couldn't kill it. And so, you know, you know, we know how tough they are. And then this old man staying behind and, and they just run. I mean, they don't even look back. They just go. Yeah. And it was, uh, really intense. And, uh. Um, kind of gets you excited about what's to come. Yeah. I always thought it was odd that it was like the middle of the day and a murderall just shows up. Because we always see him at dark or in the shadows. The murderall is in the middle of the day. He's going around asking people about the boys. I always thought they were, like who would talk to a murderall? They're servants of the dark one, right? Mm-hmm. And, but in these, in these few chapters, murderall are just walking around asking about these boys. <laughs> I thought that was kind of strange, but yeah, yeah, it was strange because you don't really ever see that again, you yeah. know, to that degree, and so it's kind of it is kind of strange that that happened. But I think too we got to take into context where it happened. It's happening in Whitebridge, right, in these areas where people still think that Midroll and Trollox are fairy tales, right? So it's kind of like the idea that if you were to actually see magic, you would convince yourself it wasn't so. So if you were actually to see like a midro person come, you would know you were scared and like, oh my gosh, I couldn't see eyes, but there had to be eyes. And he was just a scary man. So it's like, I'm sure they they just end up convincing themselves of something different. Yeah, that's true. They don't know what these guys are. And so they just think they're the weird people or this intimidating person that's talking to them. Yeah. Never thought of it that way. That's good. So yeah, that's the end of our chapter review up through chapter 26. So next episode, we'll find out what happens with Rand and Matt and we'll find out uh, where their adventures take them and if they make it to Camelin along with the rest of the group. All right, so that's Angrial, Terangrial, and Sangrial. If you have any additional thoughts or anything to add to these three things, let us know. Join us on our social media pages. Um, We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, Just search for Credible Nerds. We'll pop up and join us and join in on the conversation. Let us know what you think about these power rot objects or objects that can use the one power. So, And also about our chapter reviews. Let us know what you think. What's your favorite chapter? Uh, What do you think about Tom fighting Murdrals and Bill Doman and his ship? You know, whatever. It's about the Tuathwan. Let us know interested in having conversations about these cool things so 
Uh, also join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the credible nerds. Support us there. We have exclusive content that you only find there on Patreon. You can find our podcast on anchor.fm on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, uh, your favorite podcast app. Basically, just do a search for Credible Nerds and you'll find us. This is the fifth episode of our Wheel of Time review. We want to thank you for joining us here and may you find water and shade. We'll see you guys.